Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. At the time of recording, the discussion about the voice is still current in Australia. A lot of the discussion is about how practical it is, would it help or would it hinder, would it gum up government or reduce the gap? But there's another level of discussion which I want to explore with my guests today. And that is questions of principle of Indigenous rights in a liberal democracy. My guest is Professor Duncan Iverson, who's Professor of Political Philosophy at the University of Sydney. Duncan, welcome to Liberalism in Question. Thanks, Rob. Pleased to be here. Well, let me put the question to you. The, the recent Supreme Court decision in the United States was talking not about issues like the voice, but about affirmative action on the basis of race. And what, one of the uh, judges said this, which I think many would agree with, quote, distinctions between citizens solely on their ancestry are by their very nature odious to a free people whose institutions are founded upon the doctrine of equality. That is, I, I'd add, a liberal society. You, but you, you, you don't agree with that? No, I mean, well... I think it matters what kind of question we're trying to answer here. And of course, that case is about affirmative action. And of course. Voice is about constitutional recognition of indigenous peoples. But if we, you know, if we step back and ask about the fundamental principle, is equality, is the liberal conception of equality yeah. compatible with different forms of citizenship or different differential treatment of citizens? I think as a basic matter of principle, for me, the answer is yes. However, it really matters what conception of equality you're referring to and talking to talking about, because the liberal conception of equality is multifaceted, right? There's a it's not just simple, uh, it's not a simple concept. And in, in some contexts, treating like cases alike is the appropriate way of thinking about equality. In other contexts, in order to in a sense, redeem the principle of equality. You've got to make differential judgments and differential uh, arrangements. That's why we have concepts like equality of opportunity or equality of outcome or uh, the different ways that liberals talk about it. So, of course, there can be cases where treating people differently on the basis of ancestry is deeply problematic and illiberal, but there are other cases, as in the United States, uh, where the principle of equality is compatible with some forms of differential treatment. I think the, the, the people concerned about this issue are those, I've got one of the quote, quote from Greg Sheridan, who's been a popular um, a, mm. a, a opponent, a, saying that this proposal marks, quote, a tragic regression in Western politics, a repudiation of, quote, the ideal of civic universalism that distinguishes Western civilization at its best. Of course, it's often on the, there's something, the question is not just about equality, but civic universalism. Each citizen, in a sense, stands before the state in principle equal. Well, I think, I mean, I disagree with Greg on, on this one, because I don't think the voice in particular is proposing any kind of, or, or represents any kind of regression from an ideal of civic equality or an ideal of civic universalism. Remember, the core aspect of the voice proposal is to uh, enhance uh, democratic deliberation about um, the interests of indigenous peoples in the context of the Australian Parliament and the Australian Constitution. It's not about, it's not a conversation stopper, as I like to say. It's actually about enhancing the democratic conversation about the place of indigenous peoples in Australia. Um, because clearly what we've been doing up till now has not been doing that. So I think if, if the proposal was to, you know, create something akin to, you know, <laughs> to put it dramatically, a kind of Iranian theological council that had uh, a kind of veto power for uh, over parliament, then I think Greg's argument would have a bit more weight. But that's not the proposal at all. What it really comes down to, and, and, and look, there's good, it's a good debate to have, you know, what kind of principle of equality helps us make sense of this uh, this proposal? What what helps us understand what's at stake in in evaluating the, the proposal for a, an amendment to the constitution for, for a voice to parliament? And as I've written about in various spaces, I think we need to think about equality in this more, in this richer 
context of liberal, liberal tradition. Um, and I think there is an argument there that can be redeemed. The concern, I think, for many is the notion of constitutional rights, even, even, even if it's rights to be, belong to an advisory assembly. I'm not, mm. hearing, I'm not hearing objections to the idea of there being a, a, a body that advises on behalf of Indigenous people any more than any other bodies that uh, advise governments and parliaments on all kinds of things. It's the constitutionality, I think, is worrying people about whether this is a challenge to the Liberal principle. Yeah, well, I don't think, uh, again, um, you know, if one of the core principles of liberalism is this reconciliation between uh, liberty and equality and the extent to which democratic institutions help us reconcile these two sort of core concepts, I think, for me, the voice is a, a kind of elaboration or innovation within that context, right? So the the, the point of recognizing um, the voice in the constitution is a means of addressing uh, the fundamental place that indigenous peoples have in Australian society and in the sort of history um, of, of the country. And I think, as I said, if the voice was a proposal to somehow um, separate uh, the uh, situation or or indigenous peoples from the state. If it was if it was there to, in a sense, override the, the, the decisions of parliament, then I think we'd be in slightly dicier dicier territory. But it's not. It's essentially about democratic deliberation fundamentally. You just mentioned there, Duncan, um, the historic place of indigenous people in Australia. Mm. Now, as I understand from reading you, that's a very important point you want to make. It's not just any minority group. There's something important. What 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 is important about the historic place of Indigenous people that that persuades well, you? Well, I mean, I think, I, I mean, for me, we have to take seriously the 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 history of the settlement of Australia, and I think there is something fundamentally important to our assessment of the extent to which the voice is compatible with liberal democratic institutions, and in thinking about the fact that Australia was colonised that. Indigenous peoples were um, sort of political entities when when Australia was first settled, and that aspect of Australia's constitutional settlement has remained unresolved. So I think there is something distinctive about the situation of Indigenous peoples that does distinguish them from migrant groups or other kinds of of, of groups that you might want to sort of compare or contrast, or I've heard people say, well, why isn't there a voice for, you know, the Greek community or for the Vietnamese community? Or that Indigenous people have the same, you know, access to the voice that those other communities have. But I do think there is something important and distinctive about the situation of Indigenous peoples. Now, unlike some, I don't think that means that, therefore, um, you know, the, the, the sort of norms and values of liberal democracy don't apply in this case, quite, quite the opposite. But I think the challenge is can liberalism uh, acknowledge and address those distinctive features of this case? And I think the voice is a reasonable um, response to that. Uh, Duncan, tell me more about the, what you said, it's unresolved. What, what, what is unresolved in your, in your view? Well, I mean, yeah, look, it's a really good question. I mean, for, for me, what's unresolved is the place of indigenous peoples in the constitutional order of Australia. Um, to a certain extent, there's been a kind of negative process, right? We've a very slow process of removing various aspects of that history. So, you know, the white Australia policy, um, the Mabo decision, um, one could argue the, the, the counting of Indigenous people in the census from the last referendum. So there's been a process of sort of subtracting some of the uh, explicitly uh, discriminatory, racist components of Australia's constitutional and legal and political order. What remains unresolved is the appropriate place of Indigenous peoples in the constitutional order, given what I take to be their distinct status as Indigenous peoples. That's the part that's unresolved. And if you look around the world, different countries have addressed that in different ways. Canada has recognised... Um, Aboriginal uh, and First Nation treaty rights in their constitution. The United States has the domestic dependent nation status. That was a, a kind of uh, 
judicial doctrine articulated in the 19th century that sort of governs their um, uh, First Nations uh, position in the constitutional order. And of course, in New Zealand, you have the Waitangi Tribunal, yeah. that it's a way of, of managing those relationships. Australia lacks any structure for doing that. And I think this is partly, I agree that this part has been sort of missing a bit from, from the debate. You, um, can I push a bit further here? Is there actually a question in your mind, therefore, about the legitimacy of the Australian Liberal state until so, this is resolved? Yeah, uh, look, yeah, is, look, I is, mean, is, is, is that what you're implying? I do, I, I am, but let me put that in the context of, of a liberal principle of legitimacy. So for me, um, you know, legitimacy is, is an idea that relates to the ability of the state to justify the coercive power it exercises over the citizens who are subject to those coercive mm -hmm. powers. So there's a kind of justific justificatory um, sort of demand there. And um, the other thing I think that's important about a liberal principle of legitimacy, and this draws on different aspects of the tradition, but maybe most famously from the sort of more Republican side, the sort of more Rousseauian side, is that legitimacy is something that is constantly in question, that is constantly being tested. Now, that's not to say that at any given moment in time, if, you know, I don't like paying my taxes, I don't think the state is legitimate. But in, I'm sure many listeners feel that way. Uh, fair enough. But, um, you know, the legitimacy, you know, Rousseau had this, this idea uh, of sort of continuous consent, this continuous demand, this continuous sort of challenge to the state to uh, justify its legitimacy. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as Rousseau does, but I do think legitimacy is always uh, a question uh, being asked. It's always a question at stake in liberal um, democratic uh, context. And I think the case of indigenous peoples is a very interesting one. Not, I think, on some kind of, you know, uh, almost technical grounds that they never consented to the establishment of the state in the first place, but more, are, you know, are is the state fulfilling or is the, is the state meeting the justificatory demand that liberals have for uh, legitimacy, and I think there's a, a reasonable case to be said that um, that's a question that is still a, a live one when it comes to the situation of Indigenous peoples, at least in Australia. So you don't think the lack of consent is in, in, originally? I mean, uh, no, I mean I'm not a big that, yeah. Look, I'm not issue? a. I don't. I, I mean, I think I think I, I, I'm not someone who thinks that legitimacy is grounded in in some sort of primal consent moment. I think it's no. it, it's relevant that um, you know. To the well, you know to the extent I understand that the, the treaties weren't struck and all that, but you know the the the, the conception of legitimacy that, that I think is more interesting and more powerful here is the one that says uh, you know a state is legitimate to the extent that it can justify the exercise of its coercive powers over its citizens in a way that they couldn't reasonably reject or that they have some way of in a sense um, assenting to and. I think there's a reasonable question that one could ask about to the extent that Indigenous peoples have not uh, had the same ability to shape those laws and, and powers uh, that are being exercised over them as, other, as others, the legitimacy question is, is, is a good one to ask. When I think of the question of ongoing legitimacy, I, I, I can think of many Indigenous people who accept it fully by it, that's it. Um, the, you, you're here, we're part of you, get on with it. And others are still feeling very much a question about it. So there is not, there's not one Aboriginal, of course, there's not one Aboriginal attitude to this. No, that's right. And, that, and, and look, you know, when we're talking about these, as I said, when we're talking about these questions of legitimacy, we're, we're not talking about, um, as I said, either one shot deals, right? You're, you're unhappy with the government on Monday and the government's legitimate on Tuesday. We are talking about certain structural features um, of the system, and there's no question that there'll be disagreement amongst Indigenous communities about this. But I think, by and large, to the extent that the voice is itself the product of a general sense that the current arrangements are not satisfactory, um, there's a reasonable question to ask. But of course, in any in any of these cases, there'll be disagreement and, and different differing views so about so if, if the state of Indigenous people was not 
if, if the gap was not the gap that it is, for example, particularly, particularly with remote communities, and Indigenous people, all, we're all like Indigenous people you often find in, in, in a, um, urban Australia of similar standard of living and so forth as non-Indigenous Australians, would there still be in principle an argument for a voice? Yeah, I, it, I, I do. I, I, I think I, I think there there is. As I said, it really matters though how we cash that out because um, you know I think of indigenous peoples not necessarily certainly not as racial entities. I think that's a fundamental mistake. And the way I like to think of of them as uh, as a as a group is more along the lines of a of a, of a kind of political entity. Now that leaves a lot of questions to be resolved. Yes, what, kind, what kind of entity is, is that? But, um, and of course, there's more than one indigenous nation or group. But I think that's the, 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 the right starting point for how we begin to work through um, those questions. So you're right. If we think about the justification of affirmative action, if we think about the justification of certain kinds of group rights in liberal theory, if, if those rights are grounded in disadvantage, then the idea is that once the disadvantage is overcome, the right, the, the claim itself has sort of been yes, dissolved of or has been has been resolved. I think this is a slightly different because um, in, case. Because in, in that case, you wouldn't put it in the Constitution. Correct. Right? Correct. So and, uh, the think, I'm hearing these arguments about closing the gap. And I think I think it was just to price, but it will. If that's the reason for it, and you're putting the Constitution, you're saying we'll never close the gap. We'll always be... Uh, yeah, and I think that's a, that's that's not the right argument. If there is an argument, yeah. So I, uh, yeah. Look, so, so good. So I mean, so I do think disadvantage is relevant is relevant here, of right? Course, I mean, one motivation, yeah. no no question, is is the persistent structural disadvantage that Indigenous people face. But going back to when we were talking about you know the particular history of Australia and the and the particular history of Indigenous peoples initial exclusion from the state and then, as it were, uh, sort of discriminatory way of being included, um, I think I think it's more than just about um, addressing social and economic disadvantage as important um, as that is. Well, um, there, there were, I don't know how many Aboriginal mobs, but no, I'm not sure what to call them. They, they, they were political entities, these tribe mobs, nations, there's a whole range of them. The fact that there are so many and uh, and, and often despite what some say, at war with each other. It was not a peaceful world anymore. Can you? Can they all be just lumped together then, the way that this proposal does? Or are we really, is, is that itself imposing something? So look, um, uh, you should be careful here. I mean, um, some of this is, is a kind of question of institutional design, some of this question of, of sort of principle. I mean, as I said, in principle, I think the right way of looking at um, Indigenous and First Nations is as, as political entities or as 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 groups that are political in nature rather than racial um, in nature, I think that's a fundamental um, mistake. Uh, then there's a question of well, then how does that get represented uh, to government? How does that get represented in our constitutional structure? And of course, that's the debate we're meant to have after the impossible uh, decision yeah. is made about whether there will be a voice to parliament. For my own view, from from my own perspective. You know, there are lots of good ideas in the Calma Langton report about how you might do that in Australia. In Canada, more than 50 years, almost 30 years ago, there was a Royal Commission that looked at this question. And again, they had a similar approach whereby there would be different models of representation whereby you could capture the diversity of these views, including, as you rightly said, um, the situation of urban uh, Aboriginal people who as I understand it, though, often do have very strong relationships with yes, uh, yes. communities um, outside of the particular area they're living in in the city. So I think there are good answers to these questions. And I think it's a reasonable thing for Parliament to have a debate about if we get to that second stage. I, I think I think I was pushing back on that. You said a political entity. It was the a political entity that I was challenging, which implies a, a body. Fair project. enough. Yeah. I, I guess I was. What yeah. coherent is that, really? Yeah. Look. look so look. F fair comment. May, maybe I misspoke there. I'm I, 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 in thinking about an indigenous people. I think of them as a as a political entity. There could certainly be more than one kind of political. There could be more than one political entity in thinking about indigenous. Not, groups. No question. Have you ever seen indigenous politics in this? Country? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and look, it's not as though our politics aren't 
uh, no, <laughs> sort no, of I'm... complex, complex of disagreement and full of no, disagreement no. as well. So it's unrealistic to say somehow. But I, just, I know I just didn't want to idealize them as a somehow a unit. No, 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 group. sure, sure. But equally, we yeah, but we shouldn't idealize um, both ways. <laughs> no danger of that. <laughs> No, no, that's right. <laughs> Especially these days, that's right, exactly. for sure. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's the notion of, uh, my question, pushing back again, is the notion of a political ide uh, identity. Um, that is, is that itself imposing or create? I'll go back to creating an identity that really does. I think, I don't think, because I'm thinking of extremes. Uh, some years ago, I spent six months, three months rather, working in Darwin as an acting dean of the cathedral there. And I had an experience I'd never had before, walking down Smith Street, a, bunch of, a whole bunch of indigenous people mob there walking past me, talking in their language. Mm -hmm. And we, and we, we passed each other like two different worlds. Mm -hmm. I, I, that, I, that was quite, the, the bishop told me that's what Sydney was like uh, in the 1830s. <laughs> then I meet my indigenous, well, I've got friends, I work with one person, only discovered he was indigenous the other a few years ago. His, mm -hmm. That person was fully, for all intents and purposes, part of the wider settled nation. Mm -hmm. And the thought, I'm trying to work out how to bring those together, one person who, maybe one sixteenth or discovers an indigenous ancestor versus those who are very much today living um, primarily as a political entity in their own mob, mm, like in Darwin. Yeah, yeah look, I mean, these are, that, is, is yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, these are, these are often vexed issues. But, you know, mine, of course, we know that indigenous communities themselves have, have very sophisticated, long-standing ways of of managing and dealing with membership questions, right? So it's not as though this isn't an issue that indigenous groups themselves aren't deeply familiar with and have means and, and ways of, of managing. So that's so that's one thing. I think second thing, I think what you're getting at is, well, you know, how could a voice actually incorporate or make sense of, of, of this diversity and this well, range it's, of, of- Well, it's, it's, of, it's not so much practically how, which I think you're right. That's who knows how that'll work out. It's. Mm. For your argument to be a good argument, you're saying there is a political identity. It's not racial. Yeah. You made that point, which, mm. and I'm trying to. I'm just asking the question. Um, it seems to me very a very ragged political identity at certain ends of it. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, maybe ragged wouldn't be the word I use, but there's no question that it will be more diffuse. Diffuse. In, that's better. It's best safe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It'd be more diffuse at yes, some points diffuse, than yeah. than others. But you know, don't forget this is um, um, this is an issue that. Indigenous communities have been dealing with for quite some time, and um, to put it mildly, and as I said, they have their own uh, mechanisms and norms and ways of of dealing with membership questions. It's complicated, though. I'll say that for sure, because of course, membership of indigenous groups has been uh, mediated through. Um, the state as well. The state has intervened in in, in, in yeah. these areas as well. Famously, in you know, in North America around blood quantum um, and all that, uh, something that was imposed on on indigenous communities, but then acquired a kind of life of its own. So you're right; these are complex questions, but I don't think they are of sufficient complexity to somehow suggest uh, a kind of in principle objection to to them uh, being a way of thinking through these these matters. Let me come at this, uh, another question. I call this a statute of limitation question. Mm -hmm. so recently, I saw an article by a critic of The Voice that cited the Norman invasion of Anglo-Saxon Britain and uh, that went on in you know, 1066 and all that, and wondering whether, um, I think no Anglo-Saxons are claiming rights against the Normans at this stage. It's just, it's just too long, far ago, too mixed up. Is there a statute of limitation in matters like this, where it's just simply, it, 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 sure, no, no state. I think you say in your book, was it a Hegel? Or no, it was um, a Leviathan. It was a uh, Hobbes. Hobbes. This, no, no human state has a clear conscience about its founding. Mm. I think, I think that's mm. a, a salutary yeah. reminder. We're yeah. all in that yeah. situation. Is there a time at which you say, look, yeah, it, it, it maybe could have been better. Yeah, there's issues, challenges of legitimacy, but frankly, let the past be the past. It's too long ago. So As I you think would I, with the Norman invasion of, of, of Britain. Sure. I mean, I I think well, what's in, critical of England, I should say England. I, I think what's critical here is, I mean, in in the extreme case where the where the where the people in question literally no longer exist or are are indistinguishable from um, uh, in the way that they were at the time. I mean, in those cases, sure, there there might be a statute of limitations. I mean, if 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 a people has literally vanished, but I think I don't think that's the right. <laughs> 
comparison in this case because right. clearly um, First Nations people are still here. They're making claims. They're anchoring those claims in both uh, claims about historical injustices, but also contemporary arrangements. And um, there's a you know there's a case to be answered. So I think there are cases where the relevant peoples no longer exist in the way that it would make sense to talk about uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, there being a case to answer. And there is a kind of statute of limitations in that sense. But I don't think that applies in the case of Australia and Australia's indigenous uh, peoples. Um, can I flip it around a moment? Um, is, when the prime minister announced this, he used a strange phrase that, that he'd never quite explained, but I'm wondering what it meant. He talked about the um, the offer of this thing as a gift to the nation, mm. and I, I wish I could have asked him what mm. what, do you, what do you mean by that? Have you any mm. idea what it, uh, I've got? A, I've got a suspicion of what he might have meant, or they didn't want to say it. And that is, the gift is they will formally accept the um, membership in the colonial state and its institutions. So it, it'll be a kind of um, closure of uh, the claim that the state is yeah, look, legitimate. Is that fair? I, I wouldn't put it that way. I mean, my my interpretation of that comment, and I agree, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting word to use. I mean, my interpretation of that comment is it, it, it's a gift in that it's an offer of a way of resolving unresolved business in Australia. It's a, a generous offer. And he's but, used the word generous a number of times. It's a generous, it's a generous, it's a gift in the sense of here is a way that we can work through these issues which are clearly unresolved. I think that's the way the Prime Minister what, intended what's, it. What's what's the unresolved issue? I think I'm looking at. So as I said earlier, I think I think the unresolved issue is is the appropriate place of Indigenous peoples oh, in okay. the constitutional and political order of Australia. That's what's unresolved. Okay. I don't think even the critics of the voice, listening to Mr. Abbott the other night on ABC television, he was quick to say, I support constitutional recognition. Mr. Dutton okay. says, I'm I'm support constitutional rec I support recognition. That implies that even they although they disagree profoundly with the voice, even they accept that there's and something fact, un, unresolved in our constitutional and political order. The disagreement is about how we yes, resolve it. I think that's true. In fact, in Mr. Abbott's case, he's been a strong proponent of this from from, from ages. Correct, back. yeah. I mean, I think he's profoundly wrong about the consequences of the voice, but I, I, I think, you know, as I said, there's a legitimate debate to be had about what is the appropriate, you know, concept of equality or concept of civic uh, equality to be appealed to in this case, and he's, you know, he's got a view about that. Sure, um, I'm wondering whether people like Linda Thorpe on the, the what, which, 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 that right or left, attacking the voice from the other side, are the ones who fear this is somehow a ceding of sovereignty. Correct. I, I think you're right, I, and I think there's a very clear argument from uh, someone like Senator Thorpe, who, who and it, and it goes something like this, which is. Um, the voice actually is asking us to, uh, in a way, reconcile to a deeply unjust uh, constitution. The problem lies with the Australian state and the Australian constitution. The voice is asking us, in a sense, to to reconcile with that. So for, for someone like Senator Thorpe, the, the the question is, is, is a sort of even more <laughs> first principles based one, it's, it's we have not ceded our sovereignty and the voice is asking us to accept the sovereignty of the Australian constitution. Now, you know, there, there's questions about whether that follows from the voice. Certainly the proponents of the voice say it doesn't follow. And this is the first step to dealing with those other uh, profound questions about sovereignty and legitimacy. But you're correct. Her view is that um, this is a kind of form of entrapment. If I could put it a bit provocatively, it's a, it's a way of, you know, getting, getting Indigenous people to, to, in a sense, give up the only leverage they have. Their own moral, not just physical leverage, it's a constitutional leverage, moral le le leverage. But that, correct, but, that, correct. But, that, but that view would be saying there that the state is, in effect, illegitimate. It's a colonial correct, state. Correct, 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 correct. And I think, like I said, I have a slightly, do I have a different view uh, about the, both the nature of legitimacy and 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 also about the the the, the role that the voice um, could play. As I said, for me, the voice is a is a quite innovative way of putting in place a deliberative uh, mechanism to actually work through these issues between Parliament 
and the appropriate representatives and in the appropriate context of, of Australia's constitution. So I don't see it as a as a form of entrapment, but I well I understand I understand the, the, the objection. I understand the critique. Or it could be. I was thinking the other side round. There's a sense in which maybe it is a making of peace. Although I, I thinking practically, I fear if it does come into being, the uh, uh, massive over expectations of achievement, at least in the short term, will be very serious. I think. Sure, expectation. Uh, yeah, expect. It's a horrible phrase. Expectation management. Oh, no. is- is really is is a risk. I have no doubt about it. But there's also risks in in either not addressing these issues, or um, you know addressing them in other ways that might be less, even less, as, um, less attractive. Professor uh, Duncan Everson, as we come towards the end, can I put this question to you again? We you, you've you, you've made the case, as have many of the critics of the Voice, for some sort of serious constitutional recognition that, that's needed. It's needed. My question to you is. Why this way rather than other way? Because it's this way which is turning controversial. It's the constitutional enshrinement of what looks like an assembly with only some Australians can vote for, not others. Why do you think that's worth the trouble and not just go to another way of solving the problem? Because as I said, I think, I think what's distinctive about the proposal for a voice and what's innovative about the proposal for a voice is that it, it, it's, it's a claim about enhancing Australia's democratic conversation, not undermining it. If it was a claim, as I said, for veto power, for establishing a kind of <laughs> theocratic council that could that sat over and above Parliament, then I'd have a problem with it. Um, but it's essentially, for me, a deeply democratic move. It's about broadening the democratic conversation. It's about enhancing the voices of uh, Australia's first peoples in a way that uh, I think is is relevant to uh, the resolving the unfinished business of their place in our constitutional and legal order. And moreover, it's very it's it's very different from even a rights claim. So the claim is not to embed certain rights in the Australian constitution that pertain to indigenous people. The claim is to embed a democratic conversation in Australia's constitution that pertains to indigenous people. And I think that's a really interesting and powerful uh, claim to make. So your argument is that it's an addition which doesn't subtract from the liberal nature. Correct, correct, correct. So my argument has been in a number of places very much, uh, you know, running against the line that uh, Greg Sheridan and others have, 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 have run, which is somehow the voice is a, is, is a kind of resiling from the democratic values. I actually think it's an expression uh, of liberal democratic values uh, appropriate to the times we live in and appropriate to the particular uh, history and context that Australia faces. Well, um, that's, a, I was going to be like saying, that's a um, unusual, <laughs> not commonly held view, <laughs> but I'm very sure. keen, but, but that's one reason I was so keen to, to talk to you because uh, that I've heard very little discussion on this on the matter we've, we've discussed today uh, mm. in the debate. And we at the Centre for Independent Studies are very, Je- jealous of our commitment to liberalism in its in certain forms, and therefore, what you have to say is both of great interest, and in many cases, will be quite controversial among, amongst us. No, like I'm, I've enjoyed the conversation. Always happy to have it. Thank you very much. That's Professor Duncan Iberson, who's Professor of Political Philosophy at the University of Sydney. This has been another podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies in the Liberalism in Question series. We rely on the generosity of people like you for donation to advance our cause. Check out the links on the website to see how you can be involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.